Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to transition into IDD Adult Services webinar. This is our encore presentation back from popular demand. Thank you all so much for participating with us this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us, um, especially that um, a lot of services are suspended or on hold and a lot of folks working from home. And so people um, have not really been able to get a lot of information on transition like they normally would this time of year. So we thank you all for joining us today and we'll get started. Today's presentation uh, will be follow, excuse me, we'll have short presentations uh, from the Division of Developmental Disabilities, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services and Values into Action New Jersey, a support coordination agency. Following the short presentations, we are opening it up to question and answer panel. Uh, that is open to all attendees. You're welcome to include your questions in the chat box. We will answer those at the end of the short presentations. We also received quite a few submissions for pre-submitted questions regarding transition, um, and we will work to get an those answered as well. If for some reason we cannot answer all of the questions today, we have your email addresses and we will be following up with you so that you can have those questions answered. Uh, we'll start the presentation with the Division of Developmental Disabilities and speaking today um, on behalf of the Division of Developmental Disabilities is Teresa Santana and Christina Gonzalez. Their contact information is here. We also will share this confirmation, excuse me, contact information at the end of the webinar as well as a follow-up email that you'll be receiving either later today or tomorrow with the recording of this webinar. And Teresa and Christina, it's all ready for you. Hello, my name is uh, Teresa Santana from DDD. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Christina Gonzalez. And this, hey everyone. This, this afternoon, we're gonna talk to you uh, about navigating the DDD service system. Uh, you guys are leaving the world of educational entitlement and entering a world of eligibility, and we wanna help make that transition as smooth as possible. <clears throat> DDD is a division of the New Jersey Department of Human Services. Our mission is DDD ensures the opportunity for individuals with developmental disabilities to receive quality services and supports, participate meaningfully in their communities, and exercise their right to make choices. Next slide. In 2015, the division changed to a fee-for-service system. In the past, we were a contract-based system that utilized state-only dollars. Uh, now with the fee-for-service system, we get a federal match for every dollar spent, every state dollar spent. This is also a shift from an organi organization's working off contracts and receiving payments prior to delivery um, to people receiving payments after services are rendered, which allows for improved quality and customer service. <clears throat> Since uh, the fee-for-service system is Medicaid-based, anyone who applies for DDD must be Medicaid eligible. Uh, using this Medicaid system, we have a lot more flexibility. Uh, people used to go to a day program, let's say for five days a week. Now people are really, you know, putting in their, their own, their own uh, interest into their days and into their schedule. So some people may go to a day program a couple of days. Some people may get in support, supported employment services a couple of days. It's, uh, it's much more flexible uh, with this fee-for-service system. <clears throat> uh, we have increase in, in choices now. Uh, you can pick your, your support coordination agency uh, and you can pick who you get your services from. Um, this has really give us, uh, given us uh, an increased quality in services. Uh, this also has improved transparency. Uh, we have a supports program manual. We have a community care program manual. And uh, they're available on our website for uh, anyone interested. <clears throat> Next slide. <clears throat> Since we are a Medicaid fee-for-service system, everyone must maintain Medicaid. 
New Jersey is a work first state, an employment first state, meaning that competitive employment is the first and preferred post second <clears throat> education activity for everyone, including people with disabilities. Incorporating that philosophy, every individualized service plan has at least one employment outcome. Once eligible for our services, everyone will get a support coordinator. We have two main programs and that's the supports program and that's the other is the community care waiver which was switched to community care program. <clears throat> Next slide. After being determined eligible for DDD services, the individual seeking services will receive support, a support coordinator who will assist them in writing the plan and managing the plan. Uh, the administration, uh, like I said, it went from community care waiver to community care program. It does not impact services. It was just an administrative adjustment. Uh, the community care program is designed to meet a higher level of need. And that should not be taken as housing. Uh, people on the supports program can still get a housing voucher. That's a common misconception. <clears throat> and I wanted to make it clear that, you know, even if you're not in a community care program, you could still uh, be eligible for a housing voucher in the supports program. <clears throat> Next slide. Okay, and here is, a list of services in the supports program. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's a wide range of services, uh, assistive technology, uh, any therapies, ac occupational therapy, uh, physical therapy, <clears throat> vehicle mods, transportation. Uh, there's there's uh, goods and services, which, you know, people can use their budget to, you know, really, you know, assist with, you know, getting to and from work. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here. If you could switch to the next slide, please. And again, this is a community care program service uh, services. And again, same thing, you could get assistive technology, personal emergency response system, pre-voc employment, uh, lots, of, lots of choices for individuals. Next slide. And as we already discussed, uh, the community care program, uh, has a, has a waiting list. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't mean you can't receive services from us. You can enter in the supports program. And if you come up on the list for CCW, yeah, you can switch at that time. <clears throat> Next slide. Hi everyone, this is Christina Gonzalez. So just to follow up with Teresa, um, as you move through um, throughout the years, you transition out of high school at 21 and you will be eligible for adult services, which is uh, the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And that's where we uh, step in. Uh, next slide. So, um, we want to move into transition planning. So between the ages 16 and 21 years old, um, you should be working on your transition planning. Um, we're going to get to know your current skills and preferences, um, identify dreams and goals, um, and work on skills needed to achieve those goals. Um, once you turn 18, you are eligible to begin applying for DD services. Um, because it does take some time to uh, get that application completed um, so that once you are ready to graduate at the age of 21, you're ready to move right into the services without any uh, lapse in service. Um, there are a lot of uh, resources that you can take a look at prior to graduating high school, um, one of them being a planning for adult life um, and the web the uh, website is there for you to take a look at, and it really gives you um, a good opportunity to um, engage with st student and parent groups, um, different webinars, and it's just really good for additional resources. Next slide. So um, entering DD services. So once you have turned the age of 18, 
you are now applying for DDD services, um, you have to be Medicaid eligible. Um, once that is completed, uh, you'll begin the application and then you work on what is considered the New Jersey Comprehensive Assessment Tool, the NJCAT. Um, this is an assessment that will come out uh, and will evaluate your support needs in three different uh, areas, self-care, behavioral, and medical. Um, and then once that assessment is completed, these, uh, your son or daughter will receive uh, what is called a tier. Um, and based on your tier is based on um, the amount of money you will get uh, with a budget. Next slide. Um, so as previously stated, the results of the NJCAT um, establishes a tier. There's five tiers, uh, A through E. A being um, your least amount of supports, E, e being that you need uh, a lot of support. Um, so once that budget has been established, that's when you will uh, start working with an agency to determine uh, the different services that you may need. Next slide. So um, to ensure you have the eligible, the eligible for DDD and Medicaid, um, we, I kind of touched on this. Uh, fall prior to graduation, the NJCAT um, will be initiated and you can work with your uh, local community office intake unit. Um, February and March of that graduation year, the support coordination agency selection form will be submitted. Um, and then DDD begins the assignments of the support coordinate agencies in April. Um, so then between April and June, you're going to have a plan together and that way you can seamlessly uh, transition right into DDD services. Next slide. Oh, and that's it for DDD. Thank you, Christina and Teresa. Next up, we have the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services and speaking on behalf of that agency, Cheryl Vale and Nancy Hiller. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to have this opportunity to be here today um, and to be part of this important workshop to bring you information about transition um, for your families and your children. Um, my name is Nancy Hiller. And I am here today with my colleague, Cheryl Vale from the New Jersey Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services, which we will um, shorten by saying NJDVRS. Um, the NJDVRS is a division of the Department of Labor and Workforce Development and funded by um, the Federal Department of Education, all state vocational rehabilitation agencies are under the Department of Education, um, the Rehab uh, Rehabilitation Services Administration. And, um, and so we are both funded by the federal government and by the state government. Uh, and as Teresa mentioned earlier, um, New Jersey became a employment first state um, back in 2012, which means that employment is the first and preferred option for people with disabilities. Um, just to give you a quick background, Cheryl and I are pro uh, program planning and development specialists in the area that works in program administration um, and dedicated to developing and monitoring programs for adults and youth. Um, some, some of the programs that we, uh, that we work on are programs that involve transition and pre-employment transition services, which is why we're here today. Um, we've also worked in local offices as counselors. Uh, Cheryl was a deaf language specialist and, um, and I was a specialist in um, the mental health, um, psychiatric uh, co-occurring disorders. Um, so uh, we're really happy to be here today to be able to share information about our agency and about how we can hopefully answer your questions regarding um, your adult children 
transitioning from um, from their school services uh, as students to adult level services um, in, in the in the realm of employment. Next slide, please. Hi, this is Cheryl. Thank you for that introduction, Nancy. Um, TVRS's mission is to enable the eligible individuals who have disabilities to achieve an employment outcome consistent with their strengths, priority needs, and capabilities. So basically what that means is an individual needs to have a disability that is a handicap to employment, and they must more importantly have the desire and ability to work. So the reason I state handicap to employment is there are many degrees um, when somebody is given a label or given a diagnosis, it affects everybody differently. So I always self-disclose that currently they would probably say I have ADHD. Back in the day when I was young, they called it ants in the pants. It is not a handicap to employment for me. It works for me and I can multitask. Someone else may have such distractibility that they need a job coach or they need some other kind of accommodations on a job to better match their ability. So we look at each person as an individual, how their disability affects them and how it can be accommodated or adjusted to in order for them to achieve the best that they can within their goals and um, what they are looking to do. Nancy? Uh, next slide. Thank you, Cheryl. So let's talk a little bit about who NJDVRS uh, can help. So um, we are able, according to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 as amended, assist any person with a physical, cognitive, um, mental impairment that is a substantial barrier to employment um, where the individual um, may uh, become eligible for our services. Um, DVRS is an eligibility program and not an entitlement program. So um, it's important to understand that when you decide to um, complete a referral form, the process that follows um, is based on the information, at least at the beginning, that you provide to your assigned counselor so they can be able to review that information and be able to determine the eligibility. Um, eligibility is based on the two factors of um, the impairment um, to employment and being able to benefit from the services that you're applying to, um, to, to be able to have. Um, the services are potentially eligible for any person at any phase of their life, as long as they meet the criteria and have a barrier to employment. Um, a student can be referred as early as 14 years old, according to the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, as part of the Rehabilitation Act as amended. Um, and so those are important things to keep in mind as, um, as a person goes through their lifespan that um, it's not necessarily about just re receiving services at one point, but a person could at any point during their life, um, depending on what their issues are or their barriers to employment might be, um, come back to our VR offices and, and, and ask for assistance. Um, our counselors are professionals who are trained in the area of vocational rehabilitation and disability, its impact on individuals and on employment and on areas such as vocational assessment, vocational planning, understanding the labor market trends, demand occupations, job placement and coaching and assessing the needs for supports in order for your, um, your adult um, in your life to be able to uh, be successful in their path to employment. Um, the services are eligible to individuals who are deaf and also hard of hearing. And um, those services I mentioned earlier that Cheryl was a, 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 and is still a, a deaf language um, specialist, 
um, are available for counselors who are also deaf language specialists within their offices. Um, we are also able to serve individuals who um, who are blind um, or have visual impairments that um, that fit into um, our parameters, at, but if they would be um, extreme uh, and serious visual impairments, then we would then refer them to our sister agency, the New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired to receive those services. Um, DBRS can serve students in high school, um, ages 14 through 21, as I mentioned. Um, they would need to have an individual education plan or a 504 plan um, which is, and medical documentation plan in, in accordance with the IDEA. Let's go to the next slide, please. So we're gonna talk a little bit now about what the DBRS process um, is, uh, what, what that procedure is. So um, the first step is to fill out a referral form. And the referral forms, I believe, are, um, are, in, are, are in a link with, uh, with our resource package that Amy has put together. Um, it's on our DOL website, and you could go in for a, a confidential referral and fill it out, and it will be sent to your county office. The referral is not the application. A referral is just to get your process in motion, um, and your application um, process uh, it, uh, takes place when the assigned counselor reaches out to you and brings you into the office, or in this case, it could be virtual or by phone, depending on what that process would be in a particular location. Um, and uh, that, that would be the time when, um, when you would bring in your information, either your IEP documentation or your 504 documentation or something that would be able to um, show documentation about the disability that, um, that, that you're um, trying to uh, gain the eligibility process for. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, a youth can be uh, 14 and the school counselor should refer the student with all that information that I mentioned, either 504 or IEP. Um, most recent school psychological and medical assessments, um, which would be a child study team evaluations. It would include also that social piece of it as well. Um, once all this information is gathered and eligibility has been determined, um, the individual plan for employment is developed between the counselor and the client student um, in order to decide what services would be um, would be provided to that individual in order for them to be able to establish a, a vocational goal that leads to employment. So the vocational goal that's agreed upon um, may also have services attached to it. It might, and the, the most important service that VR can, can provide to any person is that expertise and guidance and counseling. Um, after the services are provided and hopefully employment is achieved, um, then we look at um, the steps to being able to close a particular case. Um, closure is important because, um, because it allows an individual to move forward with, with their path for employment, but Closure could also mean that um, at, that um, there's also in place uh, the long term. Uh, if a person is working and uh, and they need extra supports, um, then part of their part of their service delivery process would be the provision of long term follow along, which occurs after the case is closed. So that's all part of the supported employment piece of things, um, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. Cheryl, 
Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, please. So Nancy touched on some of these services that we can offer. Um, in general, it's all sorts of diagnostic evaluations and assessments uh, in order to either, you know, find proof of disability or eligibility to aid in developing the IEP or what kind of accommodations may be needed. Uh, we also offer trial work experience which is when an individual is kind of on the fence as to whether they could possibly work or not. We can put them in trial work and he can be fully assessed, evaluated in a real life on the job situation. We do community-based work evals uh, as well as various job experiences, which is again putting them in real life experiences, letting them see how they like a job, perhaps trying one out if it had been an interest of theirs. We do supported employment, job finding and placement, as well as customized employment. As Nancy has stated, one of the most valuable services we offer is just general guidance and counseling to help them along. A person is assigned a counselor who follows them for the lifetime of the case so that any problems that arise or any advocacy, anything like that, they can always come back to the counselor for help. We have our pre-transition services, which do end when the individual graduates high school. Because of COVID and our graduating seniors having missed out on it, they have extended the deadline to September 30th for this graduating class to obtain some pre-transition services. I'm sure when I'm done, Nancy can touch on that a little bit more. We do assistive technology. We will do an eval for an individual and that technology can look, at, look like anything from communication boards, adaptive equipment, hearing aids, glasses, that type of thing. Vehicle modifications are done that is to help an individual get to and from a place of employment. We do not do vehicle modifications for just uh, general getting around town and livelihood. So if a person is not going to work or does not work, we would not be able to do the vehicle modification. We offer skills training, support for college, um, additional job accommodations, we will talk to our employers and explain what DVR is or help to get them to understand different nuances and working with individuals who are under our purview. We do do internships, which is a fabulous service. We have a program called Project Search, which is a uh, three 10-week internship sessions that normally occurs during the senior year of school. We also encourage all of the individuals to obtain benefits counseling so that they can understand that they can work and keep their current benefits under Social Security. Next slide, please. So some things to remember with all of the services that I had mentioned. Some of them are at no cost, such as the evaluations and assessments and supported employment, job finding services such as that. Others are based on a financial needs assessment. So they would have to fill out our financial forms, we would get their copy of their taxes, and we are looking at whether it fits into our guidelines or not. Even if someone is over our guidelines for a cost service, there is sometimes a formula so that it's a partial contribution from each, or the individual you know, may have to pay for it in full, such as a college program. However, DVR can offer other services of support during that time that could complement those paid services. Each service is individualized, so no two people will come to us and get the same cookie cutter approach. We work with the person on their level, meet them where they're at, and discuss where they wanna be. All records are confidential. So if you are dealing with two agencies such as DDD and DVR, we cannot talk to each other without any form signed allowing that due to HIPAA rules. That also applies to an individual's family member. If you do not have permission from the consumer to speak to us, we cannot divulge any information. 
if for some reason the, your student or an individual comes to us and they either don't follow through or let's say they follow through, they go through our whole process and they obtain employment, at any time in the future they can come back to us. It would just have to go through the same process again. So quite a few years ago we had individuals who were teacher's assistants in various programs and at one point the state decided to add a credential to that position. We had many people come back to us for help in obtaining that credential. Or if somebody's disability becomes worse, as Nancy stated, I work with the deaf and hard of hearing, if an individual starts to have an even more severe decline in their hearing and now they need other accommodations or even a different job, they can come back to us. There is no age limit. As long as a person is willing and able to work, they can come to DVR. Next slide, please. So in front uh, of Nancy, did you, I'm I, sorry. I got it. Um, in front of you, you you'll see um, the listing for the local DVRS county offices. Um, we have uh, 21 counties in New Jersey. Um, but uh, some of the offices are, um, are, are not necessarily in every county. So um, we have tri-county representation and we have, um, we have dual county representation. So um, it, for instance, um, our, our, uh, summer, our Somerset County office um, and, and our Middlesex County office um, also assist the Hunterdon County because they don't have their own office there, although there is a satellite there. Um, and, um, and there are, and so you'll see all the listings and, um, and the contact information for the offices can also be found on our DVRS website. Um, just wanna take a quick uh, note to talk about um, pre-employment transition services. So at the beginning, I mentioned that um, that a person can can be referred as young as 14. Um, DVRS can can start working with an individual on um, on defining their uh, or trying to help them figure out what their career path at age 14. Uh, the pre-employment transition services are services that are based on the five required services outlined in the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act (WIOA) that um, that outline um, specific services that are uh, that are now required to be provided um, to students. And so, when the school system um, is unable or cannot provide certain services, um, VR will step in and assist with that. Um, it, it's important to note that the, that DVRS cannot supplant what is written into the, um, into the IEP, um, but we can um, enhance it or, and we can provide things that are not necessarily in the IEP. Um, so um, I know that there are a lot of questions that are popping up in the chat about this, which I know that Amy will try to move us along and, and help out with. But I, I, I did want to just touch on that for a few, uh, just for a few minutes. Um, next slide, please. Hi, so here's a list of various resources that are available. Um, the links that you see on the slideshow, um, I believe when you get it should be an active link to our website. We are found on Career Connections. You could just fill out the referral and it will automatically go to an individual who will disperse it to the appropriate office. You would then get a call from the office or a letter to schedule an appointment. The Social Security Administration website is great for knowledge about how you can work and maintain your benefits. There's information which you'll see right below that regarding benefits counseling. 
in the central and north part of the state is NJ Winds, while Full Circle is in the southern part. That benefits counseling is at free of charge. It is not a one-time deal. You can go back to them as you start work or as money starts coming in. It is also a good place to ask about things such as ABLE accounts so that you are able to earn a certain amount of money and set part of it aside without it impacting your benefits. So it's almost like a, a savings account specific for certain things so that you can continue to earn without having any reduction in your benefits. WinTech is a great resource. Um, it is from RSA and it gives a lot of information and FAQs regarding various programs and guidance, specifically with transition also. SPAN is a statewide parent advocacy network. I have seen them do some fabulous work uh, for parents who have questions, not sure where to go, or maybe need that added support in a child study team meeting. They can come in and help and guide and just serve as just another additional resource. And of course, the Center for Family Support is always there for additional uh, things in the area. Next slide. Cheryl and Nancy. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> great presentation, lots of information. Can't wait to get to the questions too. Thank that you very much. To at the end. Yes, thank you so much everyone so far that's presented. Um, next up we have Values into Action Support Coordination Agency um, and discussing navigating support coordination services. Um, today on the webinar you have myself, Amy Judell, the Resource Development Director with Values into Action. We also have David Cooper, a service director for the Southern region of New Jersey, and Zinke McGeady, our family mentor and SHIP counselor. Uh, both will be helping me to answer questions at the end of this panel. And getting into discussing support coordination services, um, just to tell you a little bit about Values into Action New Jersey and what makes us different. Um, for those that do not know, there are 186 support coordination agencies inside the state of New Jersey, and we happen to be one of the original three providing services for people with disabilities and their families since 2007. So we're very proud to be one of the originals. Uh, we can approve our own plans. That means an individual service plan, which we'll get into detail in a little bit. Uh, we're able to approve those without prior um, pre-authorization through DDD. Uh, we have support coordinators throughout the state um, that live in the regions and the counties in which they serve and provide supports. We also embrace family. Uh, we are one of the few, if only, agencies that have a family mentor. Of course, that's Zinke McGeady, and she is the parent of an adult with disabilities. She has been with Values for over 12 years. She knows the ins and outs of the systems very well, is a very strong advocate, is very well informed about all different processes and procedures, and uh, is also a SHIP counselor. A SHIP counselor stands for State Health Insurance Assistant Program, and that is a person who is a federal program, and Zinke is trained in that and authorized to provide service and supports uh, regarding Medicare. We also are family founded and led by local leaders. Our founders are Marion and Paul Salino. Um, they are very active inside of uh, this organization and agency and lead, um, lead us very strongly and are very strong allies for people with disabilities. We promote self-direction where you control your services. This is really a strong point that Values into Action is known for because we are known for being people um, that go to bat for people with disabilities and for being very strong allies as well. We are founding members of the Collaborative for Citizen Directed Supports of New Jersey, also known in short terms as the Collaborative. Um, the website link is here. By the way, all links that you see in this presentation today are active. You can click on them and get right to the site. Um, why the Collaborative is so well known and talked about right now is because we helped to create an interactive uh, direct support provider or a self-directed employee map. If you go to that website, you can see people that are currently available right now to provide supports inside people's homes uh, as a direct support em uh, staff employee or direct support professional for people with disabilities. 
We are also members of DDD's Support Coordination Leadership Forum, which is centered around partnership with DDD to improve support coordination services statewide. Uh, for as far as who has values into action and what do we do, uh, we are offering services and supports that are provided according to the person who's being supported, their preferences, the person with disabilities. In many cases, what we provide looks different for every person according to their wishes and desires for change. Our charge is to help each person build and sustain a system of personal support in life domains such as living where they want to live and with whom, being a part of the community, and that includes working, recreating, contributing to the community, freely choosing stable and loving relationships, and also finding and maintaining employment and other activities that create and build meaningful relationships and connections within our communities. Support coordinator facilitates your vision and helps you to identify specific goals for your future in regard to more of these life domains. Um, things we didn't discuss would be health, um, de development of the individual service plan, also known as the ISP, assistance in planning to direct your funding and services to meet your goals and vision, mm -hmm. and helping to evaluate services to make sure that those services you have chosen are in fact leading to the realization of your vision. How does support coordination work? How do you get to get a support coordinator? Well, once you're enrolled with DDD, you are able to choose uh, a support coordination agency by select, um, submitting a support coordination agency selection form. We have that linked for you here. It's also provided at the end of this webinar as well. A support coordination agency will then assign a support coordinator that works with them to work with the individual with disabilities. And then the individual and support coordinator together will identify people to include on the service planning team. That service planning team can include family members, providers, neighbors, boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, community leaders, friends, you name it. That person who is um, receiving services can identify who they want on their team. For those coming from the youth world and youth world of services through care management organization, the service planning team would be equivalent to the child planning team, the, the child family team rather, the CFT. We call it the SPT and the adult world of services. The service planning team meets and then the service planning begins. Once you're assigned that support coordination, uh, support coordinator rather through the agency, within three days, you must receive a call from a support coordinator. When you work with values into action, you'll hear from us within 24 hours of your assignment. And then within 10 days, by the way, I should indicate these are state minimums um, here, the three days, the 10 days and the 30 days. So after 10 days, you first will meet with your support coordinator and complete the person-centered planning tool, also known as the PSPT. We'll get into that in a few more slides. Um, just note please here that because of COVID and uh, currently face-to-face -face meetings are suspended, so we're presently creating um, meetings through Zoom and other avenues as well. And then within 30 days, that um, I, individual service plan must be completed and submitted and services will then begin after the ISP is approved. The minimum contact requirements for a support coordinator um, have to be monthly. They have to reach out to you at least once a month by the phone. Quarterly face-to-face uh, -face visits, once again, those are currently suspended. When we'll, we will let you know when they resume again. Annual home visits and also some services, for example, a day program would require a, review, a group home as well, should fit into that category, would require a review of the setting where those services are provided. Moving on the steps in the service planning process, um, going back to that person-centered planning tool. This is a living, breathing document. This is um, a tool that the support coordinator creates with the person being supported and then uses that um, person-centered planning tool to help identify hopes, dreams, goals that the person being supported has, and then gathers that information to develop the individual service plan. So this, as I mentioned, the living, breathing document, this PCPT is probably the most critical um, component to planning for services and support coordination 
because it helps to anybody that reads that document should be able to know about that person, what services that they like, what their strengths are, what their needs are, what their wants, hopes, and dreams are. Everything that we do is centered around the PCPT. We use that to create the individual service plan, which identifies outcomes, identifies services and providers, and then helps to budget for the services that you've um, decided to utilize in your ISP. And then following that, the individual then um, will live out the ISP through domains such as the home, employment with a job, their health, their recreation, friends and family, etc. Person-centered planning tool. Um, we get really excited about this, so I just want to give a little bit more detail on it. Um, it, uh, it is used to create that individual service plan and gathers information on topics that we discussed already, some uh, hopes and dreams, their life goals, relationships, community involvement, employment, support needs, communication preferences, and strengths of a person, and of course, voting as well. We want to take a second here to share some information with you regarding um, the person-centered planning tools and really what's going on inside the state of New Jersey um, to reflect what's currently being executed versus the hopes and dreams of people that are receiving services and supports, most specifically in life domains such as living. For example, in New Jersey, 40% of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities said that they have input as to where they live. That's 40% in New Jersey. However, 62% of people with in, uh, disabilities in the nation have input into where they live. And then in New Jersey, 33% had input into choosing where to live and 22% choosing who their housemates are. And then as far as employment goes in New Jersey, which is a work, um, excuse me, work and employment for state as Cheryl and Nancy discussed, uh, we have only 9% people with disabilities working inside New Jersey versus 19% in the nation. Yet 55% of people with disabilities in New Jersey have expressed that they want to work. And only 20% of individuals with disabilities actually have employment goals inside their individual service plans. So this information I obtained from the Bog Center of uh, Developmental Disabilities, um, great starting point. We're gonna share some resources with you from there as well. And this just really are, is teaching us that um, we can do better as an organization, as a whole, as a community as a whole, to really listen to the people that we are providing services and supports for, take their voices into consideration and help them execute their goals, dreams, and visions for their life using this person-centered planning tool. Going back to the budget tiers, uh, we talked about this with Christina and uh, Teresa with DDD, um, they mentioned your budget tiers. These are the outcomes of your NJ CAT. So you have tier A through E and the acuity as they discussed is a high behavioral or medical need. We just wanted to show you the type of budget um, that individuals um, are allocated through DDD and these are the budgets that the support coordinator has to work with in um, accessing and connecting to different services and supports. And then this is the same budget tiers, I'm sorry, uh, also budget tiers, but this is for the community care program, formerly referred to as the community care waiver, the CCP, as we refer to it now. And you can see here, if you look at the bottom, E with the acuity A has a significantly higher um, budget allocated than, than somebody that would be in the supports program. So this is a critical component and something that you can discuss with your support coordinator if it's appropriate to be on the community care uh, waiting list. And then in summary, the preparation checklist, hopefully many of you have completed this at this point. Um, these are a lot of steps to, between 18 to 21. If you have not taken these steps yet, no need to worry. You're, there's, it's not too late, you still have time and we are here to support you as well as DDD and DVR in reaching these steps. So hopefully by now you have confirmed your Medicaid eligibility. You have confirmed that you are DDD eligible and have completed the intake process. And hopefully you have received the and completed the NJCAT and researched support coordination agencies and service providers. You want to have completed and submitted a support coordination agency selection form. 
at which point you then can receive support coordination agency and support coordination assignment. If you are a graduate at this time and you have not selected your support coordination agency, now would be a really good time to do so so that the support coordinator can still connect and possibly participate with the exit IEP in these last weeks that we have of June. And then we want to also begin service planning process with the support coordinator. And then the support coordinator will complete your ISP and hopefully deliver that prior to graduation. Again, because of COVID, things are a little bit out of the normal time frame, So um, that is to be expected that um, some ISPs will be executed later on in the coming few months. And then you will be able to access your DDD funded community based services upon graduation. This next slide here is a little surprise present for you guys. I have put together 26 resources all pertaining to transition. You will have access to this um, folder. This is actually a Google Drive folder. Inside each of these folders are more resources. So you will receive an email um, for this webinar in summary. Um, hopefully by the end of today, it depends on how long the recording takes to get back to me. If you don't receive it today, you will receive it tomorrow. And inside that email for all registrants, because we realized many folks um, were unable to get on today, we had over 200 people register and the Zoom only allowed 100 in at this time. So for please feel free to share this information with your colleagues, parents, friends, and families that you are connected with, with inside your network. Um, in case they were not able to access today's webinar. And also going forward in the future, um, share, feel free to share these resources as well. As I mentioned, the follow-up email that's coming to you today or tomorrow, we'll also have a recording of this webinar and the contact information for each of the presenters, as well as the PowerPoint slide deck so that you can refer back to it. We wanna thank you so much for joining us today and also special thank you to DDD and DVRS for participating in this transition webinar and lending their expertise into their services and supports. And at this time, we will be opening it up to question and answer panel um, for the participants that pre-submitted questions. Once again, uh, we hope to get to everybody. There were a lot of pre-submitted questions. So if for some reason we cannot um, answer all of them within the next hour that we have scheduled here today, we will get back to you within a personal email to have those questions answered for you. And did we want to start with the chat, David? Okay, I have a question here. Um, it, it says, will the state extend the graduation date since uh, a person's son hasn't been able to go to school or experienced any community programs? And there's a couple questions that dealt with extending the date due to COVID and schools being closed. Want to know if graduation dates will be pushed and then um, because of that reason. So I don't know if DDD is able to answer that or if they have any administration side to that. David, can you repeat the question? Is that specifically about any uh, any services? Or are they asking about schools? Or well, they're asking about the graduation day for schools. Since the schools have been closed due to COVID, will they extend graduation? Would graduation days be extended? Okay, that's actually a question we, um, through our organizations, DDD, DVR, and support coordination, um, cannot specifically answer. That's going to come from the schools. I would, I would probably say that, you know, who, maybe either check with your local district um, school website or go on the, the Department of Education, the New Jersey Department of Education website. There might be information about graduation and, uh, and directives regarding those situations um, about that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that information for you today. Okay. I have somebody else that asked, uh, they were denied eligibility uh, for DVRS prior to high school graduation and wanted to know if they could reapply uh, for DVRS services again. So I, can you repeat what they were denied for? It just says they were denied eligibility. I guess they were probably denied services. They were uh, deemed not eligible for services prior to high school graduation. So, you know, without having more information, um, I, you know, it's, it, it's, um, 
it, it's tough to be able to answer that. But what I would say is that, um, you know, may, obviously you can apply again. That's no question. You should definitely complete a referral form again, but also look through the documentation that you may have provided to the counselor to make sure that it's updated, to make sure that it actually documents a disability, um, you know, and, and, that, and that it's, it's clear. And, uh, you know, and, there, and there's no question about it. Um, you know, again, without having that information, um, you know, it, it, it's tough to um, be able to answer that. But, you know, if, if, if you need, if you wanted to tell me more about your particular situation and, and how I could direct you, you could reach out to me offline. My contact information is listed, Nancy Hiller. So you're welcome to do that. And uh, I think we've got another question for DVRS. I think you touched on what uh, pre-employment services are, and then they wanted to know if they were currently available. So um, pre-employment transition services include five required services. It's job exploration and counseling, counseling on post-secondary training and employment options, um, workforce readiness, tra workplace readiness training, sorry, instruction and self-advocacy. Um, so those four um, can be performed remotely, okay? But um, you would need to have a, uh, you know, you would have to be able to determine the vendor who you wanted to assist you with those services if they were actually providing those services remotely. I, my understanding is that the majority of the service providers have moved to virtual platforms that are all HIPAA compliant and um, compliant in the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act requirements, WIOA. The only one of the five services that cannot be provided at this time is a work-based learning experience that cannot be at this time performed remotely. Um, and obviously, you know that there are issues with, um, you know, with businesses now, um, you know, and because many of the businesses are closed, there are issues with, um, you know, businesses who've laid off or uh, furloughed their employees and, um, and how that would work in terms of bringing students in and whether they're HR allows them to even do such things. So, um, so for now, that particular service is on hold. Um, any person who had been enrolled in a program um, and 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 uh, you know should should certainly reach out to their counselor to find out what the status is and how they can. Um, get back into those pre-employment transition service programs or get started in one of them. Um, it's uh, just, just full disclosure, our offices have also been, uh, been closed, meaning that our counselors and staff have been working remotely, but taking shifts going in, but not seeing people in person. So there could be a lag time when you complete a referral form to when you're when you're contacted so um I, I know that this is you know that that it's hard for me to ask you to do this but to try to be patient in this process as it moves along because um because obviously things have been seriously compromised and complicated because of the uh, because of covid and everybody moving to distance and remote work and learning. Okay. Um, another question, um, I guess DDD could answer is, what is the process for cooperation between DDD and Perform Care if a student is only 17, but the family's in distress and in need? Well, in order to uh, get services from DDD, you actually have to be 21. Uh, I, I, as far as any consistency from uh, Perform Care to DDD, uh, I know when you apply for DDD, if you've had Perform Care, you can apply with a short form as, uh, as opposed to the long form. 
Okay. Um, what do you have here? Uh, another question is, when do you need to choose a support coordinator? Somebody has a kid that's graduating in June of 2021 and their application for a DDD is being processed. They wanna know if they're on time or if they're behind and then not sure if their son will be with DVRS or partial school. And when do they need to have all this figured out? I don't think they're behind. Uh, the, the person graduates next year. Uh, the app, this, this is the time where you would apply to DDD and then when, uh, if you're determined eligible, then you can pick your support coordinator. And uh, I know uh, once you pick your support coordinator, if you have them pick before your final IEP, they could come to your final IEP meeting as well. So there's consistency in services. Uh, that's it, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Somebody wants to know how do they initiate a talk with DVRS? They're not fully aware about the full capabilities of their son and they want to evaluate his full potential. And then they want to know what can they do at home and then to uh, what can they do to home and encourage his particular skill? So um, a person who has not yet been connected with DVRS should uh, go online to our current connections and uh, as part of which is part of the Department of Labor website um, and complete a referral form with the county that you reside in so that we can send that uh, referral form to the local county office. Um, once your once your office uh, assigns a counselor to you, then the counselor will reach out to you and uh, let you know what form that um, that application process will look like. Will it be um, on the phone? Will it be in person? Will it be in a Zoom conference? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that, to be honest with you, because, um, you know, depending on the office and, and the procedures or, um, or you as an individual and what your comfort level is, um, you know, those might be things that you need to work out with, um, with, with the individual counselor. Um, things that you could do at home to, uh, oh, sorry. So um, you also asked about um, evaluations, about potential. So um, Cheryl mentioned that um, our services do, uh, incorporate evaluations if they are needed. So um, if, if your son or daughter requires a, um, some type of a vocational evaluation, um, that might be something that's um, as a diagnostic service that could be provided. Um, there are also types of community-based evaluations. <laughs> Daryl mentioned the trial work experience. Um, whichever one, meets the needs of the individual is the one that would be provided and recommended. And then, um, you know, obviously it's up to you to decide whether that's something that you want to pursue. Um, things that you could, what, what, what was the part of the question about um, home? Was it looking for a job or was it um, preparation? They want to know how they can yeah. evaluate his full potential to home uh, and yeah. his particular skills. So, you know, um, the, the skills that, that can be honed based on, on what are identified are things that could be uh, allowed through the pre-employment transition services. So, um, identifying skills through career exploration counseling, um, perhaps experiencing, um, you know, some type of an internship or work-based learning experience when um, employers are allowing people to come into their businesses. Um, you know, if there's something that you that that you notice or that's identified, um, you know, may, maybe there are things that you could uh, emphasize within your home. Like, you know, e even if it's trying to increase attention to detail or organizational skills or um, you know, or, or things that have to do with things that the that the person is interested in. Um, there is also media 
through the internet, like short little media bites that maybe could be helpful to hone a skill. Um, it's hard to talk in general because I'm not really sure like what the skills are yet. It seems like those need to be identified and developed over time. Um, and, you know, it's sort of a rule in, rule out scenario as well, depending on what. Yeah, Nancy, I'd like, yeah. hi, this is Cheryl. I just wanted to add on to some of the things that Nancy has said. Um, in dealing with project search in this new world that COVID has brought on, it's brought to my attention. There's a lot of things that parents can do for the individual at home, um, not only to hone skills that they may have, but more importantly, to foster independence by trying to work on those hidden skills that you need in order to work, such as self-direction, um, social skills and all that, and reinforcing that at home, giving them chores and making them do it to a certain quality and measuring that gain in quality, be it that they're setting a table in a certain way to match a picture and then repeatedly doing it through the days and marking how much they've improved on it. Building on those little hidden school skills that we all need when entering the workforce will definitely help along with the obvious independence. There are also, as Nancy mentioned, various videos available, or you can go to NJ Can and look at various jobs, what it entails, what are the soft skills and technical skills needed, things like that. So looking at the individuals who come to us and then go on to work, part of transition is fostering that independence and making them responsible for themselves. So I would say that is a major skill that has to be honed and built on and reinforced in the house. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Is it required to have SSI and Medicaid in order to participate with Perform Care or DVRS? It is not needed for DVR. Um, if you are on Social Security, that does go into consideration when we are doing our financial portion of the eligibility, but it is not mandated to have Social Security nor Medicaid. Um, there is no financial limit to what a person can have and still come to DVR because we do more than just cost services. It is only when it comes down to a certain cost services that we even look at and evaluate the financial portion of it. Any service that requires finding a job or maintaining a job, coaching, et cetera, supports, um, is not dependent on a person's financial uh, um, information or um, fi financial, um, I, I wanna say like, you know, their, their bank account or their, their earnings. Um, it, because that's not, that's not considered something that is a cost service. In addition, other services that, that are not dependent on financial terms are diagnostic evaluations, um, things that would allow us to assess an individual's abilities um, in order to be able to um, help them go from point A to point B. Um, th that would be something that is not required in terms of a, a financial, but as Cheryl mentioned, um, things that have to do with, uh, that, are, um, that are termed as a cost service, things that we would need to purchase for you, um, things that we would need to fund, um, like, a, like a, a training program, a college program, for instance, um, or um, a skills training program, or, um, a, even uh, you know, even things that are that are items um, would be things that would be dependent on the financial parameters and meeting the financial um, parameter limits of uh, of what the agency has set aside. Yeah, and normally DVR is the last dollar. So if there is insurance or a grant or something that can cover some of those cost services, that would come before DVR's money. 
in this era of COVID for individuals who are waiting to go for an evaluation of some sort. If you have insurance that can speed that evaluation along due to our shortage of staff in the offices, that would be one way to move the case forward faster. Um, I have another question for DVR. Uh, how can applications to DVRS be sent during remote working and learning? And can DVRS indicate contracted agencies working remote? So I think we talked about this a little bit before that you can go online and fill out uh, a referral form. Um, which is not an application, but the referral form itself um, would be then sent to the office in the county in which you live. Um, your assigned counselor would reach out to you and let you know what that process for the application would be um, in, in terms of whether it was on the phone or whether it was in person or maybe through a Zoom conference. Um, and as far as um, contracted agencies working remotely. Um, so the counselor would be able to have more information about the agencies, at least locally in your area, who would be working remotely. Um, generally speaking, um, and, and I'm not exactly sure what, what agency you're, you're looking for, whether you're looking for um, a pre-employment transition service or a supported employment agency provider, um, which would be employment placement and coaching. Um, but all of those would, um, are, for the most part, I think that they are all working remotely or virtually, um, it, it's a very fluid situation, as I'm sure you all can understand. Um, you know, some, some are, sort, are, are migrating toward a virtual platform. Um, in terms of a list, um, I, I, don't, I don't know whether we have such a list. We have over uh, 65 or so um, supported employment providers. Um, that list itself is listed on our Career Connections um, on, on the Department of Labor website under the Community Rehabilitation Programs. But um, the counselor would be able to, uh, to let you know the services that would be available to you um, in terms of what it was that was being uh, offered and recommended. So the support employment agencies or, um, and, and Cheryl, is, Cheryl is typing that when you go on the community rehabilitation program um, area, the, ven the vendors that she has the link right there would be able to be sorted by county in case you were wondering, um, because some of our vendors only serve certain counties and some of our vendors serve the entire state. Yeah, I just put the links to our referral form, our list of our vendors, which can be sorted by county, mm -hmm. and also a list of all of our field offices. So those are all in the chat room. Great. Another question we have is, do you have to be DDD qualified in order to work or, or to receive services from values? And can you be registered with DVRS and do not need DB, DDD services? That's kind of a split question. So I'll answer the DVR and DDD part of it in the sense of, can you get DVR and not be DDD? We are separate agencies. You can have you can be eligible for DDD and DVR, or you can just be eligible for DVR or DDD. So we are not exclusive of the other, and it's not mandatory to be in both. We encourage individuals who are eligible for both services to pursue it because we complement each other. We can never offer the same service at the same time, but we can offer complementary services. I do know that typically uh, individuals who are already um, registered with DDD, usually are the ones we get referred to us and things of that nature. So 
I would think most everybody is assigned uh, registered with DDD before they get assigned to a support coordination agency like Values or something like that. Yeah, um, this is Christina from DDD. Yeah, definitely. You, uh, you want to be uh, found eligible through DDD. Um, and then as previously discussed, you can con uh, be assigned a support court agency um, and then move forward from there. So you definitely want to have Medicaid and be found eligible. Okay, uh, the next question is, my son is 18. He just graduated from high school. He has been with DDD and what will be the step for DVRS? So it, he just graduated, he can, he can fill out a referral form or family can fill out a referral form as we've been talking about. Um, right now, like I mentioned earlier, it's online um, and he can, um, you know, and, and he'll be assigned a counselor and move forward uh, from there. Okay. Um, another question, if a student graduates in July of 2021, when would services start? I mean, from my experiences, services start after the individual graduates. So that's what I think the answer should be for that one. Anyone from DDD, would there be any different? Um, so DVR depends upon the services because as stated before, we do pre-transition service, we do counseling and guidance, and we help get them prepared for what happens when they graduate. Ideally, there's a plan in place prior to graduation, so it can be started immediately. There are certain services that we can't do until an individual graduates, but the plan is already in place. That's the goal of doing all the planning ahead of time so that when they do graduate high school, they know what's the next step. Question about um, applying for Medicaid and what happens if the individual moves out of state? Uh, well, you would apply for Medicaid uh, with uh, social services. Uh, moving out of state, it depends. Uh, are, are you still going to be considered a resident of New Jersey and you're moving out of state for certain services? Or if you're moving out of state, then I believe you would have to uh, inquire Th uh, for services through the state you're moving to. <clears throat> um, if, if someone um, has met with DVRS in early March, but they needed to be evaluated by the DVR psychologist, how should they proceed with that? So, you know, Cheryl mentioned a few minutes ago that if a person needed an evaluation and they think that it would be quicker to be able to go through uh, their insurance. That might be the way to go. Um, having an evaluation, um, you know, in, it, on on a platform is complicated. So we, you know, so a psychological evaluation is generally administered in person. Um, there, there needs to be a conversation, the, you know, between the person, family, guardian, and the counselor to be able to determine whether the, the client, the student, can effectively participate if you're talking about an evaluation using technology and resources like with a video conference or a webcam or a smartphone. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not so simple. Um, it may be worthwhile to, if you can't have that through insurance and the person, and, and you're, you're not sure if you're going to be able to get evaluation results that will benefit the individual because of the circumstances, meaning that they may not have the capacity to have an evaluation that's going to be reflective of their needs and their and and will not represent them in the long term it might be worth it to wait um i i understand that you know this is a very complicated situation and you know everyone is different so there may be people who can be able to be evaluated um 
through in a, a remote situation, but there may not be, uh, that might not be possible for some of our clients. Um, so I, I would say that this is definitely a, con it can happen, but it's a conversation that needs to happen with the counselor so that everybody needs to be on the same page. You also have to, you, you also want to make sure that because in a psychological evaluation, it's not just talking, there's also, um, there's, there's also um, testing that takes place and there are aptitudes that are needed in order to facilitate that if it's remote. And that may not give anyone a result that, or data that can be used that would benefit the individual. So having a conversation to determine if the remote evaluation is something that you can do, um, if it's beneficial for that individual is something to consider having. Um, and it might mean that you need to wait in what it, like if it could be done in person at that point, might have to wait a couple months for that to take place. Yeah, you could reach out to the local office if you've already had a counselor and that was the plan. Some doctors are, excuse me, are able to do remote services at this time. There was a lot of, um, they, there had to be approval made so they couldn't automatically go to telemedicine. Some offices do have a few doctors who are doing evaluations, but as Nancy said, should really look at the case-by-case -case basis as to whether that is the best format for that individual to gain and garner more accurate and best results for them. So I would say reach out to the counselor and just ask. Um, we have another question in the chat. What would happen if a student under 18 is under 18 and is receiving services from Perform Care? and the parent is unable to care for their child anymore, what happens oh, to them? Really, really bad. They were feeding every building. David, uh, the last part of the question was cut out. Can you repeat okay. please? I'll repeat the whole thing. What would happen if a student is under 18 and is receiving services from Perform Care and the parent is unable to care for their child anymore, what happens to the child? I don't know if DDD is able to answer that question or might have some knowledge. I think they would have to reach out to their uh, perform care uh, case manager, whoever is uh, in charge there. Uh, as mentioned previously, we don't provide services until the age of 21. Right. <clears throat> Zinke, would you happen to have any information on that as the family mentor? Do you, have you seen an experience or a scenario like that before? David, can you repeat the question? Um, if, if there was a student under 18 and they're receiving services from Perform Care and the parent is unable to care for the child anymore, what happens to the child? Wow. Um, the student is under 18. Is mm -hmm. that what you're saying? And <clears throat> the parent is not able to care for the child? Yes. Well, then that would be something that would be addressed, I would assume, through DCF. Yeah. Mm -hmm. been as the agency that um, represents and supports people that are under 21. Yes, child service, child and family services. Right. Okay. So it's CSOC, um, Children Services um, Services of, um, help me out here, everybody, Ch um, Children Services of Care. Through, Children's um, System of Care. But thank it you. DCF is Department of Children and Family. CSOC is under their umbrella. Right. You want to first go with uh, Department of Children and Families, possibly DCPMP, Department of Permanency and Protection, Children's and, Protection. And someone would help out with support um, and, you know, take the helm on that. I think I covered all the questions inside of the chat box and I hit a few of the main ones on the pre-submitted questions. Um, was there any of the questions uh, anyone had that, you know, we didn't get to or I missed in the chat box?
Uh, and then I can guess I can ask this one too. Uh, somebody wanted to know where they can get information on alternatives to guardianship and then the requirements to get social security. Um, I would think that you may want to reach out to um, or look up the Guardian, New Jersey Guardianship Services uh, website to see if there's a different in, uh, additional information there. Um, as for um, how to apply for Social Security, is that what you said? Yes, they want to know where they can get information about the requirements to get Social Security. Um, there is uh, on the Department of Human Services Division of Developmental Disabilities page. Um, there are a bunch of links where you can um, go ahead and apply for services for eligibility and anything you need to know for Medicaid and Social Security. And I also, hi, this is Zinke. I'd like to throw out for the Social Security, you can obviously go to their website as well. Mm -hmm. um, they have an awful lot of information um, on their POMS, which is program administr... I'm just messing up on all my acronyms today. I'm sorry, everyone, not enough coffee. Um, their POMS is their um, program operational manual, and they would have an entire, you know, section dedicated to what the um, criteria is that you would need to adhere to in order to enroll in SSI or be eligible for um, SSI or SSDI. Um, the other question, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought was about alternatives to guardianship. And um, I would definitely look on Disability Rights New Jersey and Community Health Law Project websites to see if there's any information there. Also, Don Hoyle, H-O-Y-L-E, he is based out in the Midwest and he has an entire um, website dedicated to that. And there may be a webinar on the horizon. I don't know if Amy wants to say any more about that, but um, I know there might be a webinar on the horizon that would um, give you some more options, you know, as far as alternatives to guardianship, because there are many alternatives. Yes, thank you for talking about that, Zinke. I just did put in the chat. Um, two resources for guardianship. Good starting points are Disability Rights of New Jersey and the Community Health Law Project. They have some good websites and also um, attorneys, some, some of whom actually have disabilities who can um, answer those questions best. And we are in the process um, right now of planning a webinar with Disability Rights New Jersey on guardianship and alternatives to guardianship with a launch date in August. So we will um, share that information with you all um, and anyone that's registered here today. And I'd like to give a shout out to Barb Coppins, who has been a very long standing employee of DRNJ and Barb is saying yes that you can reach out to our yes. Disability Rights New Jersey and um, I'm sure if you call the front desk and talk to them and let them know that you'd just like some information on alternatives be more than happy to provide that to you. Perfect thank you and thank you Barbara for being here today. Okay. Um, we have a question about if someone's denied social security who is able to help? I guess they're looking for like if they're denied who could they where could they find help I guess with the process that, that would be the community health law project I, mm -hmm. I believe that they can assist with uh, an appeal of social security benefit yeah and let me just throw out some um, even before you get to that level so what happens is a lot of times not a lot but I've heard over the years that and this is Zinke again that family members you know, they apply for their um, adult child or a sibling or whomever, and um, once they've applied, if they're denied, they let it go and they wait a year and then they apply again. But the, the better um, process is to continue to appeal because as you go through each step of the appeal, you, it will be looked at by a different set of eyes. And by the time you get to the third level, and this is a quote from um, a former um, director of the Trenton Social Security Office that once it gets to the third level, it's usually a completely different outcome. It's a completely different team that's reviewing it. So it, it's really, you know, I suggest that you just persevere with that as well. Don't give up because you received one denial letter 
go ahead and appeal that and then, you know, go up the chain of command, but also just so that you have this in your back pocket, like Nancy said, contact Community Health Law Project. They have various offices across the state. So when you Google them, look up, you know, the office that would be in your area. And we have somebody who asked about how to get a support coordinator. Um, I believe you get uh, the SCA selection form and you fill that out and send that into the division. And I believe Amy uh, said there's uh, a link that we have and um, you can go there and you can obtain that form. Am I right, Amy? Yes. Uh, let's see if we have anything else here. <clears throat> Hi, uh, does anyone, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go right ahead, Dave. I just saw a question pop up. I wasn't sure if you saw that yet. From Yeah, I just got down there, too, there. So uh, okay. <laughs> does anyone have resources to help out students who are not documented? Mm. What type of resources, Ms. Weatherington, are you looking for? There's actually quite a few. Um, and, and she's... <laughs> in the Essex County area, um, works with the Hi. school system there. So just checking in with her about what sort of resources you're, you're looking to see, identify. Okay. Yeah, so hi, hi everyone. Um, so I was just wondering, well, I had a situation with a student who is now 21 years old. He was, at, his family was actually given misinformation. Um, so he's been with us from the time he was like 17 or 18 years old. So. His family was actually told that he would not qualify for Medicare, I believe it was, or Medicaid, um, whatever deems you eligible for DDD until he's been in the country for um, five years or, or something like that. Right. But that information, I believe, was incorrect. It's actually the parent that didn't qualify for it, not him as a student. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I'm just trying to prevent something like that happening again. Um, and yes, this young man actually was just waiting around for the five years to be up. And um, so he hadn't had any um, services, basically, through um, Medicaid or Medicare, I believe. That's a great question. I've heard this before. Um, Teresa and Christina, are you able to answer that from DDD's perspective as um, kind of the gatekeepers to um, other sources? Once they're eligible with DDD, they can oftentimes access other resources and of course the budget allocated through DDD through Medicare, um, I'm sorry, Medicaid. Um, are you guys able to um, answer that for this person um, who is uh, undocumented at this time, or is his parents undocumented, or is it both, Miss Weatherington? So actually, um, his mom had been in the states for quite some time, and then he came around. Um, it was like maybe sixteen or seventeen years old. He had been with us for not quite five years, so maybe four years. He had been with us um, in school, though. Um, and it's so funny because he uh, did qualify for DVRS. So he was signed on for pre-ed services. However, when it came to um, getting him set up or, you know, starting him with starting his family with, with gathering documentations for him to be um, qualified for DDD, um, the family was told that he couldn't because he didn't qualify for the Medicare yet. So in order to do DDD, Medicaid, I'm sorry, I get the two mixed up. So in order for him to be um, deemed eligible for DDD, he would have to be Medicaid eligible. Is that so? Yes, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's where the issue then lied because now he's still waiting for his Medicaid eligibility in order for him to be signed on with, Meta, with DDD services. Um, he's currently a graduate of ours this year, but his um, services wouldn't kick in yet because he's not Medicaid eligible yet. Right. Does that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hi, um, hello, Ms. Weatherington. This is Nancy Hiller. Um, I'm wondering if the family reached out to SPAN for assistance. Um, they might have some very good resources 
to recommend because even though it's, uh, you know, they, they primarily work with educational issues, they do work with many students who are undocumented and, um, or, or have documentation, um, you know, trying to become documented. So, um, you know, that might be a resource for you as well. And I believe that SPAN is part of our, our resource links. So um, that might be something to consider. I'm also going to put um, an email address for DDD's Medicaid eligibility. Ask. Um, they may have some additional information for you. So you can email them and see what they have to say as well. And hi, this is Zinke. I feel like I just read recently, speaking just to this point, that the um, student does not have to be in the country for five years in order to be eligible for Medicaid. So maybe that's something we all look into and get back to Ms. Weatherington. Yeah, Zinke, that's, that's where uh, this, this family was like misguided almost. And um, I feel like we kind of dropped the ball with that because um, and, and the person who was um, in charge of making sure the families were signed on with DDD got that information and it wasn't correct. Um, so basically what happened was this young man, um, you know, was sitting at our, you know, was in our school all this time and that person never really um, did the research to find out if that was in fact true, just basically took what whomever said for face value, basically. Um, so with that, he's, like I said, he's graduating this year from us, um, but uh, he's still not, you know, signed on with DDD. Although, um, because mom didn't, you know, follow up with the Medicaid either. Well, let's see what we can find out and we'll circle back with you. All right. Thank, thanks so much. I would really appreciate that. Um, like I said, if nothing else, I just don't want it to happen or this to happen to another family um, because there are some families in our school that I'm learning that are undocumented and, and it's not a shared, um, it's not shared information. I kind of like fall upon that information um, and then when I do, it's kind of too late to even help out with it. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we have a question for DVRS. Is uh, Can the state of New Jersey DVRS give any kind of referrals or do they have any kind of relationships with other states so that if an adult receiving services moves, they don't have to start from scratch in their new state? So um, every state obviously has um, vocational rehabilitation offices. Um, we do not refer and can't, and because we don't know what types of services or who actually provides those services in other states, meaning we don't know if their who their vendors are. So when a person wants to move out of state, um, generally, um, we close the case here in New Jersey. Um, if, the, if the other state, um, once the person goes and applies and they sign some type of a, a, a release form, it's possible that we could actually send some of the things that, some of the records that we have. So for instance, if, um, if there was an evaluation that was administered and the person signs a release form with their counselor in their news in at their new office um, we could potentially send that information over so that the other people could look at the evaluation and the results so then the person wouldn't have to have another evaluation um, in in a particular situation um, but um, it, the case doesn't, the, so, but we don't refer people to other offices out of state. It's really the same process that needs to be followed again, a referral form and then an application and meeting with counselor, developing 
the plan for employment and, uh, and, and services that are agreed upon um, for that individual. I hope that answers your question. That's all the questions I have in the chat for right now. I don't see anything else coming up. Thank you, David. And You're thank welcome. ADD and DVRS so much for joining us today. Um, we will be sending you a follow-up email, everyone um, that has registered, as I mentioned earlier, that's going to have this recording, the uh, PowerPoint presentation, the resource folder, and everybody's contact information. If your question wasn't answered today for some reason, we happen to not see it or skipped it on accident, please feel free to reach out to us um, to ask that question. Also, if you um, come up with new questions, Today, tomorrow, or ongoing, feel free to reach out to us as well. We oftentimes hear from people long after these presentations have occurred um, because they've seen the webinar recording or just happened to find our contact info. We are more than happy to be of assistance for you. Uh, we hope that all of your questions were answered today and you found this uh, presentation and question answer informational and helpful and we wish you the best of luck in your journey to transitioning into the world of adult services. With that um, we hope you all have a great rest of your day and enjoy your summer and we will be doing these um, series of presentations for transition resuming again in the fall um, probably September October time frame so keep an eye out for those. Have a great day everyone thank you. Thank you.